The PM promises more rallies despite flack over his bulletproof vest. More eruptions expected from Mount Rupeu and a Blues clean sweep in Rugby League's State of Origin. From National 9 News, this is Nightline with Gina Boone. Good evening. The Prime Minister has urged states to get on with the job of gun law reform. Faced with mounting opposition from the shooter's lobby, Mr Hard said tonight he would not back away from his tough stance and fended off criticism over his move to wear protective clothing. Laurie Wilson has our report. The Prime Minister wouldn't comment on the security arrangements which saw him don a bulletproof vest when he addressed yesterday's rally in Sale. But he said he wouldn't be deterred from his plans to attend a series of public rallies to defend the gun reforms. I intend to uh, go around the country explaining in, in parks and halls and big community gatherings not only this decision, but also other decisions that my government will take. Well, Prime Minister, given what you had to wear yesterday, were you frightened yesterday? I wasn't frightened yesterday. Mr Howard made it clear, though, he did have some concerns. There are some people who seem to me to have a sick interest in guns, but I accept that a large number of people who are opposed to what the government is doing are, are law-abiding, decent Australians. As for the Prime Minister's decision to wear protective clothing, that sparked intense debate. The whole thing smells to me of a stunt to try to arouse public sympathy for the Prime Minister and his stand against shooters. He was at absolutely no risk in a gathering like that. There was strong support, oh, though, from uh, other quarters. There, there is no doubt with the threats that have been floating around that uh, uh, obviously personal security has become a major concern for politicians. The Prime Minister says he's not about to brand all sporting shooters as Rambos, but clearly he does believe the gun lobby has distorted the issue. And this thing has got out of perspective. We're not banning sporting shooting. We're not banning all firearms. As the government introduced its legislation for a gun levy, the Prime Minister urged the states to get on with the task of passing the new gun laws. Laurie Wilson reporting for Nightline. Victorian police have defended their sale of high-powered firearms, which were surrendered during a gun amnesty. They included military-style automatics, which will be banned under new national gun laws. 56 weapons worth around $32,000 were exchanged for new guns with a dealer in Bendigo in 1994. Police say that in future, surrendered guns will be destroyed. The Queensland government claims it may have to bring in higher taxes as early as next month to cover the shortfall caused by a cut in federal grants. Premier Rob Borbidge believes he has three options to cut programs, sack public servants or increase revenue. He says he prefers the latter and would target cigarettes and alcohol. The man accused of the New South Wales backpacker murders gave evidence at his trial today for the first time. Denying any involvement in the seven killings, Ivan Malat told the court he had never been in the Blanglow State Forest where the bodies were found. For 12 weeks, the Crown has set out to prove that Ivan Malat killed the seven backpackers whose bodies were found in the Blanglow State Forest. Today, he flatly denied he had anything to do with the murders. Taking the stand, 51-year-old Malat was asked by his barrister Terry Martin, did you kill any of the persons located in the Blanglow State Forest? Malat replied, no. Were you involved in any way in respect of those deaths? No way at all. Ivan Malat said he'd never owned a Ruger rifle, the type of weapon used to shoot Caroline Clark and Gabor Neugebauer. And he told the court he'd never seen the Ruger rifle parts hidden in the wall cavity of the garage at his Eaglevale home, nor did he know they were there. But Malad did admit he stored huge amounts of ammunition of varying calibres in his roof. He estimated he had between 20 and 30,000 rounds for the Chinese weapons alone. He also said that while he worked on the roads near the Blanglo forest during the years the backpackers disappeared, he'd never been into the forest itself. Ivan Malat will continue giving evidence tomorrow. Fleur Bitcon for Nightline. A teenage girl jailed for killing a social worker two years ago has been charged with attempted murder over a siege in Sydney today. The 17-year-old kept police at bay as she held a sharpened piece of plastic at the throat of another girl at Yasma Juvenile Centre in Haberfield. She was arrested when she jumped into the centre's swimming pool. Neither girl was injured. 
Russia's election is over, and only one thing is certain, there is to be another poll. Boris Yeltsin gained most votes, around 35%, just ahead of communist Gennady Zuganov. But not enough for an outright win. There'll now be a runoff between the two, with the man who came third, Alexander Lebed, playing a key role. In Moscow, the horse trading has begun. Boris Yeltsin and Communist leader Gennady Zhuganov fighting for the crucial support of former Army General Alexander Lebed. The handy slab of votes he picked up in yesterday's election has suddenly found the Afghanistan war hero a big shot of a different kind. I think it surprised a lot of people, he said, considering I was dismissed from the army last year, then did well in the election race. Lebed's share of the vote showed he's the preferred choice of those sick of Yeltsin, but too scared to bring the communists back to power. Yeltsin is already believed to have offered Lebed the plum job of defence minister. Lebed has seen what was once Russia's pride and joy, the military, downgraded to a second-rate force. Wages not paid, the arsenal poorly maintained, humiliation in Chechnya. Saw points high on Lebed's agenda. His main point is to start a meaningful military reform in Russia. Uh, he understands that uh, the Russian army cannot survive in its current shape. Aged to Lebed claim the communists have already thrown a tempting offer of their own on the table. The post of prime minister. Zuganov denies that, but admits he is holding talks with Lebed tomorrow. At a press conference a short while ago, Zhuganov said Lebed based his strategy on criticizing the course of the Yeltsin government. If he now brokers a key cabinet post with Yeltsin, it will be a political defeat for him. Meanwhile, Zhuganov has also been wooing the support of ultra-nationalist Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Yeltsin appeared on television once it was clear there would be a second ballot, saying it would be a simple choice of going back to revolution or forward to prosperity and stability. This is Jim Whaley reporting from Moscow for Nightline. Our political and military leaders today paid tribute to the soldiers killed in last week's helicopter collision near Townsville. Eighteen candles were lit at a memorial service in Canberra. One for each of the men whose lives were cut short. Under a cold and sombre sky, it was the nation's turn to one of the 18 men who gave their lives in their country's service. Just a few weeks ago, political leaders came to this same Canberra Cathedral to mourn the dead of Port Arthur, Australia's worst mass shooting. Today, an altar draped with the national flag bore the sandy and blue berets of the two regiments devastated by our worst peacetime military tragedy. As the mother and sister of Captain Tim Stevens, the SAS unit commander killed in last Wednesday's exercise, gave each other what comfort they could, 18 candles burned to the memory of all the dead. Trooper Jonathan Church. And it was fitting that the army's famous insignia was used as a symbol of hope. The Rising Sun badge is also a powerful symbol. Its rays remind us that after darkness comes light, that after despair comes hope. And then they relit the candles. After the service, the mourning continued. The message from the nation's leaders was heartfelt. Eventually, the grieving will pass, but not the honour that's due to men who put themselves in harm's way for their nation's sake. Immediately, the tributes to the men of the SAS and Army Aviation will continue tomorrow. Just as they did in the wake of the killings at Port Arthur, Prime Minister Howard, Opposition Leader Kim Beasley and the Democrat Senator Cheryl Curnow will travel together to a special ecumenical memorial service in Perth St Mary's Cathedral. The West Australian capital is home base for the Special Air Service Regiment. Peter Harvey reporting for Nightline. After the break, New Zealand's Mount Ruapeu erupts and the hunt for the Manchester bombers.
Sydney Rugby League player Wes Patton is claiming damages from New South Wales Police for distress and humiliation. This follows an incident five years ago when he was pulled over at Redfern during the making of a documentary on police. Yeah. Um, that's him driving it though. Where is he? Is he, um, community or what? Yeah. Am I going to say good day to eh? The Tigers halfback claims he was forced from his car and spoken to in a demeaning manner because he is an Aborigine. You knew that front one was bald, didn't you? Have a look at it. Patton has taken his complaint to the Equal Opportunity Tribunal and could be awarded up to $80,000. The two policemen say race did not affect their treatment of the footballer. Volcanoes largely created the North Island of New Zealand. Now their restless force is back on full display, with Mount Ruapeu erupting today, sending debris shooting a dozen kilometres into the sky. Proof of how treacherous volcano predictions can be just last week, scientists downgraded Mount Ruapehu to the lowest level of eruption risk. They forgot to tell the mountain. At daybreak, after eight months of silence, New Zealand's biggest volcano blasted back to life. Rocks the size of refrigerators were propelled through clouds of ash and steam. The enormous forces setting off lightning bolts. The debris has forced airports to close up to 200 kilometres away. The tourist city of Rotorua has been plunged into gritty twilight. Yes, it's just amazing. It's in your throat, it's in your eyes and stuff like that, in your hair. So you've got to wear your hood and all that. But it's absolutely amazing. It's like um, uh, there's no sun. There's no lava flow, but rivers of fast-moving mud are spreading from the major crater. Nearby ski towns are being evacuated. What volcano? <laughs> <laughs> Devastation for the uh, ski industry, that's for sure, and the whole Rupay district will be affected by it. An aviation danger zone has been declared covering thousands of square kilometres, although observers have been flying dangerously close, trying to read the forces at work. <laughs> This is the second major eruption in less than a year. Scientists say larger explosions are possible, but they don't think they're brewing for the big one. We're not going to see an escalation of a hundred times, say, just within seconds. We're, we're, what we're predicting is something a little bit more orderly. But tonight, hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders are living under an ash cloud. Hugh Rimmington for Nightline. The British and Irish governments say the weekend bombing in Manchester by the IRA could force a rethink of the peace process. More than 200 people were injured when the bomb packed inside a van exploded. Police hope a street security video may lead them to the bombers. With the centre of Manchester still sealed off, the hunt for the bombers now focuses on the van they used to deliver a tonne and a half of explosives. These pictures of the blast were captured by a police security video Police know the van was sold on Friday to a man who sent money in an envelope by taxi, but it was definitely an IRA operation. In Belfast, American Chairman George Mitchell is trying to keep the Northern Ireland peace talks alive. We strongly and unequivocally condemn the bombing of Saturday. Uh, such violent acts have no place, and we hope that this process will go forward. But unionists say Sinn Féin should be banned from any future dialogue and British ministers are casting more gloom on the talks. You can't uh, let off a bomb in Manchester on Saturday, declare a ceasefire on Sunday or Monday, and expect to be let into talks on Tuesday. The Irish government will tomorrow discuss severing all ties with Sinn Féin. It appears the Manchester bombing may have destroyed any hopes of peace in Britain's troubled province. Raymond Dale for Nightline. Australia's first shipment of nuclear waste has led to protests in Scotland where it arrived today on a container ship. Greenpeace has called on Australia to take back the 114 spent fuel rods from Sydney's nuclear power plant at Lucas Heights. They were unloaded and taken to the nuclear facility at Dunray, where the waste will be reprocessed and eventually returned to Australia. Now, news just in, a huge earthquake measuring eight on the Richter scale has rocked eastern Indonesia. Seismologists say Bali would have been severely shaken and there are dangers of landslides. In a moment, gun owners, or gun owners' anger rather, over John Howard's bulletproof vest, Paul Lynham talks to sporting shooter's boss Ted Drain. <laughs>
Sporting shooters have reacted angrily to the revelation that Prime Minister John Howard wore a bulletproof vest to yesterday's rally in Victoria. Shooters leader Ted Drain says Mr Howard's armour was reminiscent of Ned Kelly and demonstrated a sick and insulting attitude towards an assembly of decent Australians. From Melbourne, Mr Drain is speaking with Paul Lynham. Ted Drain, welcome again to Nightline. Thank you, Paul. How does it enhance the image of the gun lobby to, to have people at that rally in Victoria at the weekend chanting abuse, making Nazi salutes at the Prime Minister? These were shooters, these were firearm owners, and this continual reference to the gun lobby, it should be a reference to firearm owners. And they were angry, and I can understand why they were angry. And once they learnt that uh, John Howard wore a bulletproof vest, I guess they'd even be angrier. Do you think that was a mistake? certainly was. I mean, he doesn't want to go down the road of America. Well, I guess we'll see the bulletproof limousines next and uh, the blokes running alongside the car with the machine guns under their coats. I mean, if he wants to go the way of America, he's certainly doing a good job of it. So you think his uh, security advisors were wrong with that one, do you? I believe so. I mean, we've never had that sort of thing happen in Australia before, or probably uh, we did have happened with Ned Kelly. He, he wore a suit of armour as well, but that was a long time ago. But we've had MPs getting death threats, uh, uh, white feathers with the black dots in the post, a couple of uh, uh, devices in the mail, suspected letter bombs. This is uh, uh, surely enough to alarm any security advisor. Well, I'd like to see some of these so-called letter bombs. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, more a figment of people's imagination, and certainly a feather in the, in the mail is no real problem. Nobody's been ever, ever been beaten to death with a feather. Uh, I think it's an overreaction. The death threats can be very disturbing. I've been getting them for 10 years and nobody's ever bothered to protect me. And I did ask for it at one stage, but then I'm not the Prime Minister, so I guess uh, that's the difference. Do you accept tonight that you've basically lost your battle? It's a long way. We may have lost one of the battles. We haven't lost the war. And uh, you, you told me before that the levy now is being introduced into Medibank. Our advisers tell us that that's unconstitutional. And we will challenge that. It should not be in the Medibank levy. The Medibank levy is for Medibank. No other purpose. So you'd take that to the High Court, would Certainly you? would. And now that you've had time for, for a fair bit of feedback from your membership, what do you think will really happen when the states bring in this legislation and we get to the point where the clampdown is in effect? Do you think a lot of guns will be hidden? In Queensland, in Tasmania and in New South Wales, they'll never know where they are. But in a lot of country towns, the local police know who's got a gun or two, don't they? Yes, they do, but the local police are also local police. They know local people. Uh, would you expect a local policeman to go out and arrest somebody he's known for 10 years, somebody he knows is not un uh, unlawful, that he knows is not a crook, that he knows is not a criminal? I don't think it will happen. So the law won't be implemented, is what you're saying? It's very rarely implemented now in most of these cases. So why should this be any different? If we had have implemented the laws we have with firearms, perhaps the thing in Tasmania would not have occurred. Why didn't they talk to us about these things? I mean, we could have worked this out without the sort of confrontation we've got now. Without our Prime Minister talking to people with bulletproof vests on, we could have done this in, in a, a quiet place, worked it all out. None of this needed to happen. I th really think that Mr Howard wants to get rid of the National Party, and I think he's doing a damn good job of it. He told Ray Martin earlier tonight on A Current Affair that some people have a sick interest in guns. Well, that may be his view, but certainly the one and a half million people out there that own firearms, uh, I'd, I'd say the great majority of them don't have a sick interest. They have an interest, but I don't think it's sick. I think it's pretty sick if somebody calls a meeting of shooters and then goes to that meeting with a bulletproof vest on. I think that's pretty sick. Ted Rain, thanks for your time. Thank you, Paul. Gina, back to you. Thanks, Paul. Still to come on Nightline, the finance and weather and Eddie Maguire's sport. Eddie, big changes for the AFL. Yes, that's right, Jenna. Chief Executive Ross Oakley is giving the game away. Also tonight, State of Origin League, golf, soccer, and Luke Longley stars as the Chicago Bulls triumph. Good evening in Rugby League New South Wales. Tonight, made a clean sweep of the State of Origin series for the first time since 1986 but only just. A late surge by the Queenslanders brought them within one point of the Blues, but the New South Wales defence held on. New South Wales were chasing a clean sweep. Queensland had pride on the line. And look at this driving defence! An early penalty gave the Maroons a two-point start, but despite plenty of ball, they couldn't add to the lead. What brought them a try in Sydney has failed tonight. 
The Blues had to make the most of their chances. Andrew Johns pushed and shoved and dodged his way into the clear before a magic backhander put E.T. under the post. He comes from nowhere and puts it down. Queensland tried to hit back before the break, but Billy Moore was unable to handle the sharp Langer pass. Has gone begging. A change of ends and a lucky break put the Blues back on the attack. Mullins flying under a well-placed bomb to post New South Wales' second try. It's a try scored by Mullins. A penalty from this high shot on Eddingshausen put the Maroons 12 points down and in desperation mode. Dean Pay pulled up Langer short and high. Langer played on quickly, Brasher's sin bin for a professional penalty. Queensland couldn't capitalise though, New South Wales working back down the paddock, Bittler slotting the cleanest of field goals to give the Blues an important 13 point break. How important became clear as first coin scored the series most ugly try. He stepped on it and dived over. Then Brett Dallas weaved his way through for the most spectacular. Their lead cut to one, the Blues had to hold on for three minutes of sustained attack. The Knights' last play ruled offside, New South Wales taking the series 3-0. Mark Barland for Nightline. Here's a great game there. Well, AFL Chief Executive Ross Oakley has announced his resignation after 10 years as football's leading man. Oakley will step down at the end of the centenary season when the League Commission will announce his replacement. Tonight, two favourites have emerged for Oakley's position, the league's number two administrator, Ian Collins, and one of the game's sharpest operators, legal advisor, Geoffrey Brown. This was to have been a routine quarterly information meeting of clubs, but Ross Oakley's retirement took precedence. I think there's an end point to everyone's uh, uh, task in a, in a job like this. It was back in 1986 that Oakley grabbed the reins of the then VFL. Oakley only intended to serve five years, Another five rolled on before he was content with standing down to possibly take up a job with the Sydney 2000 Olympic Organising Committee. I don't know what I'm going to do. Actually, I've stage. offered to uh, supply him with... Uh...